broken hearts in yet another American town. Shocked by devastating violence, this time at that Florida high school on Valentine's Day. The survivors of the deadly school shooting in Florida say they're turning their anger into action. Never again. That's the rally cry. The adult politicians have been playing around while my generation has been losing our lives. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we've been tracking this week. We call BS! The teenage survivors of the latest U.S. school shooting have brought the skills of a new media age to America's debate over gun control. Freedom of the press in Eritrea is virtually non-existent. By trying to tell the story from afar, Radio Arena has become part of it. The Egyptian authorities tend to disapprove of the foreign news media, and the latest case of that involves the BBC. Usually, we start by covering the news coverage of a story that's still breaking. Sometimes, though, it's worth waiting for a story to play out, then examining what's been reported in the aftermath. That school shooting in Florida happened more than three weeks ago. 17 dead, 14 of them students. Unlike some previous school shootings in the U.S., the survivors did not shy away from the cameras. They went looking for them. The teenagers used the plentiful airtime they got to push for tougher gun control laws. And they found themselves taking on not just politicians, but one of the most potent lobby groups around, the National Rifle Association, the NRA. And as the attention of the mainstream news media turned elsewhere, as it always does, the argument goes on, the students, along with gun control advocates, slugging it out with the NRA and its backers. Our starting point this week is the media space in which most of this fight is now being waged online. I'm a mom, and just like millions of other women, that's why I own guns. NRA TV isn't necessarily hugely popular. Cut the crap. Fight this violence of lies with the clenched fist of truth. But when they do put out a message... Fighting for every inch of our freedom. It is so good. We demand the freedom to defend our families. I watch those videos, and by the end of it, I'm like, I need to go get me a gun, right? That's the idea. NRA TV wants more Americans to buy guns. It goes after those who stand in their way. And that, the channel would have you believe, includes the U.S. mainstream news media. The mainstream media love mass shootings. This video, posted seven days after the massacre in Florida, did not target politicians or activists advocating gun control. It was devoted in its entirety to the way the news media cover the issue. The mainstream media just put out the casting call for the next mass shooter. Well, as a conservative who has spent much of my career condemning the liberal mainstream news media in this country, I think that philosophically the NRA is right to do it. Now, do they overdo it? Uh, probably so. Tragedy is their business model. Mainly because when you don't like the message, you attack the messenger. To those who stain honest reporting with partisanship, it plays very well. It is red meat to the conservative base. It's in the NRA's interest to convince their user base that the mainstream media can't be trusted. The hatred, the pettiness, the fake news. We are done with your agenda to undermine voters' will. Because if their users mistrust the mainstream media, they're going to be more likely to listen to NRA as a source for their news. The first mass school shooting of the modern era in Columbine, Colorado, took place in 1999. Since then, the set-piece coverage has developed along lines like these. The mainstream media provide initial wall-to-wall -wall reporting, while endeavoring, they promise, to respect the wishes of the bereaved. The identity of the perpetrator is revealed, their social media accounts scoured for motives and ideologies. The gun control debate rises to the top of the news agenda temporarily, and American legislators, scores of whom, accept donations from the NRA, offer tweeted thoughts and prayers, as opposed to meaningful change, as the story recedes from view. This time around, however, there were some wild cards in the mix, surviving students who, through their savvy communication skills and social media accounts, made their voices heard and drove the news coverage in a way that no one at Columbine could back in the day. These are students that were raised with the expectation that a mass shooting could happen to them. 
They have watched other shootings happen on TV. They have grown up with this as a real possibility in a way that in 1999 was not the case. So they responded in a much different way. It's something that they have studied and thought about. So when it happened to them, they were ready to speak and they were prepared to speak. The kids nowadays have uh, practice in performing to wider audiences. We call BS! They are on social media constantly. They know exactly how to talk to wider audiences, exactly how much they have to be informed in order to talk to wider audiences. So it's something that most of us don't actually know how to do, and I think that played a huge part in this. I mean, these kids at the end of the day that the shooting happened had already mobilized an entire movement, and that's something that we've never seen before. We've certainly seen people advocate for gun control and, you know, stronger regulatory measures in the past, but to have it done so outspokenly by survivors in such an immediate way hasn't really happened. Students. The students propelled themselves into a position of prominence and landed on a national stage a CNN town hall debate on the issue of gun control. Why do we have to march on Washington just to save innocent lives? Critics on the right accused CNN of exploiting the students, saying the time was not right, the wounds were still too fresh to talk about gun control. An argument somewhat akin to saying that after a terror attack, news outlets should not discuss national security. CNN doing the television town hall and providing a forum for the students was absolutely not exploitation. I really am bothered by the notion that students advocating for their own right to safety in the school is exploitation. Senator Rubio, can you tell me right now that you will not accept a single donation from the NRA in the future? It was a staggering moment of television where you had politicians who take NRA money like Marco Rubio, uh, and you had the NRA spokesperson, uh, Dana Loesch, actually have to face student survivors uh, in real time on television. Conspiracy theories born on the internet, one of which suggested some of the students were imposters, actors infiltrating the story, made their way onto mainstream right-wing outlets like Fox News. And the allegation has been that they are in some way in contact with organized anti-gun groups and people... Exploitation by the liberal media, outright fraud on the part of some students. Conspiracy theories were offered on them both. Part of the students' power is that they are young, that they experienced this firsthand. It gives them a moral authority, and the best way to undercut that is by undermining their credibility. There's been all kinds of conspiracy theories. They've doctored yearbooks to make it seem like the students don't actually go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, that they go to another school. There was a theory floated that one of the students, David Hogg, was actually a 26-year-old felon from California. And this narrative made it onto Fox News. In fact, this narrative made it onto Fox News several times to the point that other outlets like CNN and MSNBC had to talk about this conspiracy. These people saying this is absolutely disturbing and I'm not an actor in any sense, way, shape, or form. I would say if you're able to make it onto the three biggest cable networks in, in U.S. television, your conspiracy theory is wildly, wildly successful. Now this is just crazy. Uh, it's absolutely nuts. There's no logic nor evidence to support it. But that, unfortunately, doesn't seem to matter in this very strange world we're now living in because people will believe whatever they want to believe. And it certainly doesn't matter to the media outlet who is selling the conspiracy theory. And it was an indication of just how broken our news media in this country is, especially when it comes to partisan outlets like Fox News Channel or others that try to emulate being Fox News Channel on the internet. So where does the story go from here? Probably nowhere. It does what all school shooting stories have done, with NRA TV chipping away at the credibility of the liberal media. With every broadcast. Conspiracy theorists selling their wares in the right-wing bubble, and a little help from Fox News and a few others, the story just fades away. Their social media skills and powers of persuasion served the students well, extending the story's lifespan and likely changing the template of the coverage of such tragedies in the future. What they haven't changed is the outcome. 
maybe next time. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar today with one of our producers, Flo Phillips. Flo, late last month, a journalist in Slovakia, Jan Kuciak, was shot dead along with his fiancée. What kind of work had he been doing? Kusiak was investigating the influence of the Italian mafia in Slovakia and its alleged ties to people close to the prime minister there, Robert Fico. Kusiak had been working on the expose for his own online publication, Actuality.sk, and although he was killed before the article was finished, it was actually published posthumously. This is the first killing of a journalist in Slovakia since it became an independent country in 1993. So what kind of impact has it had there? Seismic. Last week, thousands of Slovaks marched across 25 cities carrying banners that read, an attack on journalists is an attack on all of us. Now, Fico has made no secret of his contempt for journalists in the past, calling them dirty anti-Slovak whores and slimy snakes. He's clearly feeling the heat on this case, though, offering a €1 million Euro reward for anyone who comes forward with information about the killings. And this is not a case to be viewed in isolation, is it? Definitely not. This is the second time in just six months a journalist has been murdered inside Europe's borders. Last year, Daphna Caruana Galizia, a Maltese investigative journalist, was killed by a car bomb. She, too, was working on stories about corruption and the mafia. Now, the other story that you've been looking at involves the BBC's coverage of the troubled state of human rights in Egypt and the serious ramifications that came out of one particular report. At the end of February, the BBC, which is actually one of the few international news outlets that still has a bureau in Egypt, aired a piece by its Cairo correspondent, Orla Guerin. It's as if the revolution has been erased and along with it, the hope it brought. It was part of a series detailing stories of torture and of people being disappeared, allegedly by the state. And with the presidential election coming up, this report has not gone down well with the authorities in Egypt, has it? Not at all. In that BBC report, there was an interview with a mother who talked about her daughter, who she said had been forcibly disappeared. It didn't take long for Amra Adib, one of the most prominent talk show hosts in the country, to find the daughter and put her on the air, where she denied her mother's allegations. Then, Dia Rashwan, the head of Egypt's State Information Service, the SIS, called into Adib's show. <laughs> The SIS then issued a long statement critical of Guerin, questioning her integrity and calling for a boycott of the BBC. It's not the only example of Egyptian authorities teaming up with the media there to discredit the coverage of the country by foreign news outlets, and I'm sure it won't be the last. OK, thanks, Flo. Every year, the French media watchdog group Reporters Without Borders ranks countries in its index on press freedom. Eritrea has consistently been the worst of the worst until this past year when it rose by just one place above North Korea. There is only state-run media operating within the country, so many Eritreans rely on a news outlet operating in exile. Radio Arena is based in France with journalists across Europe and beams its way home via satellite and shortwave. The station has come to inadvertently provide a lifeline for some of the thousands of refugees fleeing Eritrea every month. Many are kidnapped along the way by human traffickers and held for ransom. For them, Radio Arena plays two roles, one part news source, one part hostage negotiator. Before we show you this report, know this. We tried to talk to Eritrean officials to get their side of this story, and they weren't interested. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the state of the media in Eritrea and Radio Arena, the news outlet on the outside, trying to make a difference. I 
This is Meron Estefanos. She is a human rights activist and a journalist at Radio Erina. On her show, Voices of Eritrean Refugees, Estefanos highlights the plight of those who have fled her home country. And in doing so, she's become a big part of those stories. Hello? Hello? Hi, Mangus. The man that just called me, his two children who are 12 and 13 got kidnapped in Sudan and he's being asked for $10,000. And this is a newly arrived refugee himself that have no money. So I was trying to convince him, it's okay, you know, call my friend, I send you the number, uh, she will help you. To understand why Eritrean refugees call a journalist in Sweden when their loved ones are held for ransom in North Africa, you start with the story of Eritrea. After a 30-year war of independence with Ethiopia, the new president, Isaiah Safwerki, who has now been in power for 26 years, chose not to hold elections, but keep the country on a war footing. In 2001, he shut down all privately owned news outlets and began expelling foreign correspondents until none were left in the country. All that remained was state media, news outlets that tow the government line. So there is only one government newspaper, one TV station, one radio station all run by the, by the state. And journalists of those who work in the government, like, they don't have any freedom to express or they don't have, like, so the media basically portrays as if the country is progressing, well as where everybody knows that the country is just like regressing again. When the Arab Spring was happening, the Eritrean state TV, like none of the Eritrean uh, state media was reporting what was going on in Tunisia, in Egypt, in uh, Libya. I remember watching the day that uh, Mubarak was ousted. I start watching the state TV the whole day, thinking, will they say something? It was never mentioned. So uh, the people are very ignorant. They do not discuss real issues that happens in the country. Any meaningful journalism on Eritrea tends to happen from outside of the country, which is why we're here in Paris. It's where Radio Erina is headquartered. It was set up in 2009 by a group of exiled journalists who used to work for state media. Now, from the safety of France, they can cover issues like immigration, national service, and the Constitution. Radio Erina was set up with financial assistance from the media watchdog group Reporters Without Borders. According to research conducted by the media development group Deutsche Welle Academia, it is now the second most listened to radio station in Eritrea, behind only the state broadcaster. Our first target is the people in Eritrea, uh, of course. Uh, we broadcast via satellite uh, and shortwave. Inside Eritrea, the only channel you get is the government uh, uh, media. Of course, the Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC, uh, other medias, you can find them on the uh, um, satellite channels, but not in, in their own language, not in, in, in Tirinya. We also stream uh, online for uh, Eritreans outside the country, which is our second uh, target uh, audience. Most of the news that Radio Arena broadcasts are, are not covered in, by the local media. It helps confirm the rumors in, in town by doing interviews or by getting access from other sources. That's how it just became like lifeline between home and the diaspora. Eritrea produces an estimated 5,000 refugees a month. For many, Radio Erina is their primary source of information and can mean the difference between life and death. They face different challenges along the way, so Radio Erina tries to produce coverage that will help them at every stage. We kind of uh, put them in three uh, different uh, categories. For those who are inside the, the refugee camps, uh, we try to explain the hardship, the danger they face if they try to cross to uh, European countries. Uh, for those who reach their destinations, we try to give them information, kind of like uh, how to integrate and try to live uh, a new life. For those who are uh, on the road, they do face the biggest challenge. A lot of uh, terrible things happen. Eight years ago, as Radio Erina was getting started, a disturbing trend was developing along one of the main escape routes out of Eritrea. In the Sudanese and Egyptian deserts, refugees were being kidnapped by human traffickers and held for ransom. They would be given a mobile phone and told to call relatives and beg for money. Families that did not pay would have to listen to their loved ones being tortured repeatedly as the human traffickers tried to extort their ransoms. Which is where Estefanos comes in. 
as one of the only journalists covering the story, the victims and those trying to set them free started calling her for help. She became a go-between. As a journalist, Estefanos would shine a light on individual cases, and as an activist, she would help raise the money to pay their ransoms, which raises the ongoing debate over whether or not to pay ransoms. But in this case, it's hard to argue. The people that I was talking to on a daily basis kept dying one by one. I felt helpless. I did not have that kind of money. And then I talked to, there were a group of 29, 28 men, one woman, younger uh, woman who was 18 at that time. And her story really touched me. And uh, everybody was saying, we understand, like, you cannot raise money for 29 people, but can you at least save this girl? Because for them, it was too much to see their sister that traveled with them was being raped, gang raped in front of everybody. And they said, please help her. She doesn't have anybody. She comes from a very poor family. So that kind of motivated me to raise money. So I did not use Radio Rana, but social media saying the girl that you heard in my program is in this kind of position. So let's do something. What sets the Eritrean refugee story apart is that they are not fleeing a war, but the byproduct of a war. Mandatory national service was introduced to rebuild the country after Eritrea's war with Ethiopia. The terms are meant to be 18 months, but according to Amnesty International, they can be indefinite, often lasting decades and are a form of forced labor, which the government denies, but most Eritrean refugees will tell you it's why they fled the country. Two years ago, the EU quadrupled its foreign aid to Eritrea to $237 million to keep refugees out of Europe. The money came with the vague proviso that Eritrea would improve its track record on human rights. However, when a France 24 crew was granted rare access to the country, it managed to show through an unscheduled stop on its guided tour that the practice of indefinite national service continues. There's no limit. We're not paid. They don't give us anything. It's the military service. Eritreans who listen to Radio Erina will know the horrors that await them if they flee the country but still they choose to leave, which should tell you all you need to know about life inside Eritrea. But despite that, this journalist is asking them to stay. Migration is not the solution. Uh, fleeing is not, is not gonna change anything. I strongly believe that. So I, I try to talk as much about these issues, about the kidnapping, so that people don't even attempt, like whatever is making you happy, try to change it in your country. But if you flee, this is what will happen to you. So discouraging people from fleeing from Eritrea, this is one of the things that I fight for. Inside uh, Eritrea, people are afraid of uh, talking and there is mistrust between colleagues, neighbors, friends. What we uh, created is people start to talk. Uh, what they hear about uh, uh, Eritrea uh, from, uh, from our radio. So if you start talking, about some issues, then you're building trust. I think it has a lot of impact in, in, inside Eritrea. Finally, going back to that BBC report that we touched on earlier on human rights violations in Egypt. When the disappeared daughter turned up on Amra Adib's program, she became part of his diatribe against the BBC. But the BBC is not the only international news organization to come under attack by figures in the Egyptian media. We'll leave you now with some of Adib's shenanigans, along with a few other examples of the kind of routine discrediting of foreign news outlets that Egyptians can see on their airwaves week in and week out. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. This is the الأمر يعود لحضراتكم أن أنتوا تشوفوا الحقيقة إيه وإيه الموضوع وأرجو أنه البي بي سي بموضوعيتها المعتادة أنها لما تشوف حاجة زي دي تقدر ترد عليها أحريك مقدم بلاغ ضد نيويورك تايمز ومراسلها احكي لي التفاصيل اتهمت في ديفيد باتريك اللي هو المؤسس الصحفي الاذاعه هذه المكالمات عبر التقرير الصحفي انا عايز اسال سؤال هو ديفيد باتريك ده موجود في مصر؟ اه موجود في موجود مصر موجود في مصر يعني انا بعتبر ديفيد باتريك هو عضو اصيل واساسي في تنظيم الجماعه الاخوانيه الارهابيه وده واضح يعني من كتاباته وتحقيقاته الصحفيه من 2012 وقبل 2012 رويترز النهارده فابريكه خبر وانا بقول فابريكه خبر شائعه 
اي كلام ضد مصر خبر لف الدنيا انا بقول لكم لف العالم الجزيره بقالها مده بتهدي هذيان وخلاص انتهت اسطوره المهنيه بتاعه قناه الجزيره يعني يعني عصفوا بمهنيتهم بالكامل